So we'll begin the presentation with uh, a quick recap of what Evil Twin is and then the rest of the session is organized as follows. We'll look at some of the fundamentals of multipod and then look into the technical details uh, that uh, uh, that are related to the operation of multipod. Specifically, we will uh, kind of see what are the technical details involved in the operation of a multipod and why multipod can evade the present day defenses. Then we will move on to two specific threat scenarios that are caused by multipod and finally we will have a demonstration of multipod threat. So let us have a quick recap of uh, Evil Twin. So in case of Evil Twin, basically an attacker sets up an AP that looks similar to a legitimate AP and uh, tries to lure an authorized client to connect to such a AP. So once the connection happens, the attacker can perform uh, man in the middle attacks and retrieve sensitive information from the client. And as many of us may know, uh, there are uh, various tools uh, that are commonly available on the internet uh, to perform uh, such an attack. And example tools include Karma, Delegate D, Hotspotter and so on. So this threat is more rampant in hotspots and it can also be uh, uh, present in enterprise uh, and uh, academic environments. So looking at the picture, what we have is a legitimate AP with XYZ as SSID and we have another AP which is represented in the red color and this is a evil twin of that AP with the same SSID. Now the Wi-Fi client which is supposed to connect to the legitimate AP is actually connecting to the evil twin AP and through this the attacker can basically uh, launch man in the middle attacks on this particular client. So having seen what an evil twin is, let us look at what are some of the prevalent countermeasures uh, against evil twin. So level one defense. So what we are looking at here is see if we can avoid a client to actually connect to the evil twin. So this is a wonderful idea because it eliminates the problem completely. However, let us see to what extent this can be practical. So we give uh, three examples of how this can potentially be achieved and see what are the limitations of those. The first one is what is known as a watchful user, in which case the user is so knowledgeable and observant that he will never connect to evil twin AP. As most of us know here, there is no such thing as a watchful user and obviously this does not work. So another potential approach is to use some kind of mutual authentication between the client and the AP. Uh, to make sure that the client is actually connecting to a genuine AP. However, the problem here is this will work only in certain scenarios such as enterprise networks or academic networks where it is known a priori what is uh, what are the list of APs that are authorized. If you consider the hotspot scenario implementing such a policy, uh, such a mutual authentication may be impractical or close to impossible. Similarly, the third option, which is to have a pre-programmed list of legitimate uh, APs MAC addresses will also not work in hotspot environments because it is hard to know what is the universal set of MAC addresses that correspond to a hotspot uh, vendor, for example, T-Mobile. And hence, this approach, though a very good idea, is not foolproof and not always practical. One more interesting thing to note in this approach is that it requires a some kind of a client-side software to basically uh, ensure that the client is not connecting to evil twin APs. And as we all can expect, the users can manually turn off that software and go ahead and connect with the evil twin. So this necessitates a level two defense. And the level two defense we are looking at is what is known as a wireless intrusion prevention system and a wireless intrusion prevention system consists of a set of sensors which scan the wireless medium or air and uh, uh, determine whether certain communication is authorized or not. So once it determines that, a cer uh, that certain communication is unauthorized, 
it can take some preventive measures to make sure that uh, such a communication does not happen. One of the uh, popular uh, techniques used to prevent such unauthorized communication is what is known as over the air session containment. So in this case, the, sen uh, the sensors uh, transmit certain packets on the wireless medium to disrupt unauthorized communication. And a popular technique used for this is known as deauthentication technique, wherein the sensor launches a deauthentication attack to break the communication between the unauthorized client and the AP. So for example, in this case, once the sensor detects that a client is connecting to Evil Twin AP, it will launch the authentication attack to disrupt the communication. And the good news is that uh, such a communication can be easily disrupted using this technique. So having seen what is Evil Twin and what is a good countermeasure against it, let us look at Multipot. Multipot is simply multiple APs acting as Evil Twin. So one can notice that this is a simple extension of Evil Twin. However, as we all know, simple things can also be dangerous. So and that is what Multipot is. And in case of Multipots, we have multiple APs with, multiple, with identical SSID and they feed data into a common endpoint. An example of such a common endpoint may be an attacker's laptop and the attacker can use such an AP, uh, uh, such a multipot, to launch man-in-the-middle attacks uh, against uh, authorized clients. So one of the key things to note in case of multipot is that the previously discussed deauthentication technique does not work against this. The reason being, once the uh, session containment starts on one of the APs uh, to which the client is associated, the client simply hops to another AP and still continues its communication. So that is the reason why Multipot is a serious threat. So looking at the picture, we have an authorized Wi-Fi client that is supposed to connect to a legitimate AP, but it is actually connecting to a Multipot, which are indicated by two APs represented by red color, and the client is still able to communicate even in presence of session containment of a wireless intrusion prevention system. So this slide is a graphic representation or illustration of what happens in presence of a multipod and authorized client connecting into it. So as we see, there is an authorized client which is connecting to a multipod which consists of three APs. So it is currently connected to one of the APs in the multipod. However, let us see what happens when a wireless uh, intrusion prevention system launches deauthentication based session containment on this particular uh, session. As we are seeing, the connection between the client and the first AP in the multipod got disrupted. However, the client immediately hops to the second AP and is still able to communicate with the attacker. So this process continues. And the end effect is that the client communicates without any major disruption, even in presence of session containment of a wireless intrusion prevention system. So having looked at the fundamentals of multipod, let us do a threat analysis of multipod and see some of the technical details behind this. So one of the things to note is that a WIP sensor has certain finite delay associated uh, associated in uh, detecting a new association and launching the deauthentication attack. So there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that the sensor needs to operate on several channels to determine or uh, to detect any unauthorized communication. As we all know, there are 14 channels, a maximum of 14 channels in the dot 11 G band and similarly there are about 25 channels in the dot 11 A band. Further, to complicate the matters, uh, there are certain proprietary modes such as the Atheros Turbo mode on which the sensors need to scan to comprehensively determine any unauthorized communication in the environment. So as a result, the sensor has to spend its time on several channels and the reason for that being uh, most of the sensors that are out, de out there today are built using commodity hardware and such hardware is not capable of transmitting and receiving on several channels simultaneously. 
So as a result, the sensor needs to dwell on each channel for some time and then scan uh, the various channels in some order. For example, it can do that in a round robin order. So there is always a finite delay associated in determining a new association and taking some countermeasures against that. And our observations indicate that the delay can be of the order of uh, a second and even up to 10 seconds in some systems. So having looked at the sensor behavior, let us look at the behavior of a client. So let us have a quick 101 of what happens when a dot .11 client receives a deauthentication packet. So after receiving a dot .11 deauthentication packet, a client basically enters what is known as the MAC level reconnection state. So in this state, it performs a probe, uh, it enters a probe phase, an authentication phase and an association phase before it can actually transmit the data. So looking at the picture which explains this in a slightly more detailed way, after receiving a deauthentication packet, the sensor, the client enters a probe phase wherein it visits various channels and tries to compile a list of APs uh, that are available. And it uses some logic to determine which AP it needs to connect to and once it does uh, determine the AP, it will actually enter the authentication phase wherein it will go ahead and authenticate with the AP. And finally it binds with that AP through the association phase and then it is ready for further uh, activities such as the data transfer or a higher level authentication which is the case in, uh, in scenarios such as dot .11i or uh, RSN uh, security networks. So the important point to note here is that the MAC connection handshake uh, logic or scheme is not specified in the dot .11 standard. So as a result, various vendors implement this logic in their own ways and what we have seen is there is a certain heterogeneity in the way uh, they implement this. Uh, what, what I mean is that some of the clients are really aggressive in reconnecting to a AP whereas some of the clients are not. And the next slide is uh, basically some is presenting some experimental results on what is the what is known as the reassociation latency uh, of a client so we define the reassociation latency as the time required for a client to complete its association uh, after it receives a deauthentication packet so uh, what we are looking at in this particular picture is that uh, we have uh, plotted the reassociation latencies of four cards uh, three of them are different models of the popular Centrino client and one of them is the Cisco 350 client card. And we have used a D-Link AP for these measurements and uh, what we have done is uh, written our uh, uh, packet injection tool to launch deauthentication packets and come up with some homegrown scripts to basically do a uh, trace analysis uh, on the timing of uh, reassociation. So it, looking at the graph one, which uh, represents Centrino 2200 model, we can clearly see that the client reassociates with an AP in less than 100 milliseconds. Although we see some uh, numbers which indicate that it is taking up to 400 milliseconds sometimes, but more often than not, it is reassociating uh, within 100 milliseconds. And the same observation holds true for Centrino 2915 and the more recent 3945 model as well. Similarly, a Cisco 350 series card also reassociates with an AP uh, in, in the order of 300 to 500 milliseconds. So what this means is that the clients such as Centrino and Cisco 350 are really aggressive in connecting to an AP and uh, we have frequently observed that Centrino client can reconnect to an AP within 30 milliseconds and that is real quick. So analyze, uh, summarizing the threat analysis we have done so far, a WIP sensor uh, has certain finite delay associated, in, uh, associated with it in determining a new uh, connection and that is of the order of seconds. However, certain fast clients such as Sentinel and Cisco 350 reconnect with an AP and this is of the order of milliseconds. So obviously what we are looking at in the case of multipart is a scenario wherein the VIP sensor gets trapped into a cat and mouse game with the client and given the above timing disparities, it is always the client which is going to win this cat and mouse game. As a result, in, in case of multipod, 
the client's wireless application continues to work with minimal disruption even in presence of a uh, deauthentication based session containment. So having looked at the reason for the behavior of multipart, let us see how prevalent countermeasures perform against it and why they do so. So as noted earlier, deauthentication based session containment is not effective for multiparts due to the fact that the client hops to uh, hops to multiple APs. And similarly, uh, as we have noted in case of uh, Evil Twin, client side software is also not enough because user can simply turn it off and then circumvent the solution. Another uh, popular approach which is used for containing unauthorized wireless uh, communication is what is known as wired side port blocking, in which case uh, the intrusion prevention system identifies the port associated with unauthorized wireless communication and then simply turns it off from the wired side. However, it should be noted that this also will not work against a multipart. The reason being multipart will not have a controllable switch port associated with that. This is because multipart involves an authorized client connecting to an external AP and we will not have any controllable switch port related to that external AP. Continuing on our countermeasure analysis, one might argue that starting session containment on uh, multiple channels uh, concurrently may be a good solution for this. However, our answer is no. The reason being a VIP sensor will have to send the authentication packets at a certain frequency for reliably blocking the communication of multipod. However, as we have just now seen, uh, certain clients reconnect with their APs very quickly and that is of the order of 30 milliseconds in many cases and the sensor will not be able to uh, block the communication on more than two channels uh, concurrently. So uh, this is also not a good solution. And similarly, using multiple sensors, say N sensors for blocking multipod is also not a good idea. For one, it is not scalable and the second reason being it is relatively easy for an attacker to set up n plus 1 AP in the multipod and beat the countermeasure. So what we are presenting now are some packet traces based on our experiments uh, which uh, validate our understanding of a multipod. So this uh, particular packet trace was collected with a multipod with two APs, one AP on channel 6 and another AP on channel 11 and the client used was a Centrino client. And we collected the packet trace uh, using Wireshark utility which is freely available uh, over the internet. Looking at the red arrow at the top right corner, what we can see is that on the channel 6, the sensor is launching deauthentication packets and this has prompted the client to move to the uh, move to the AP on channel 11 and uh, it continues its communication on that channel. Although that is not shown in this uh, particular trace, uh, by observing the ping packets of the client, we are able to verify that the client indeed is uh, continuing to communicate. After a certain point of time, which is about slightly more than two seconds, the VIP sensor detects that the client has actually changed the association and moves on to channel 11 to launch the deauthentication attack. That prompts the client to actually come on channel 6 and at this point we are clearly seeing that the ping traffic of the client is continuing. The same pro procedure can be observed uh, in the uh, red arrow, bottom red arrow indicated uh, in the slide and here we are seeing that the uh, deauthentication packets are again seen on channel 6 which means that the sensor has started laun launching the deauthentication attack on this channel which has again prompted the client to move to the channel 11 and continue its traffic. So this slide shows similar data but with HTTP traffic. So what we are seeing here is that the client is able to uh, co continue on its web transfer even in presence of a session containment. So this particular trace uh, confirms our understanding that on launching a deauthentication attack, the clients in a multipod, uh, the client in a multipod scenario hops to multiple APs. Basically, what we are showing here is that uh, a ethereal or a Wireshark trace 
with the appropriate filters applied to show only the association response packets and we can clearly see that the client is continually associating with uh, the APs in the multipod one after another. So having seen the reason for multipod behavior, let us look at two major threat scenarios in which multipod, multipod can cause a security issue. So the scenario one is what is known as the naturally occurring habitat wherein uh, which is uh, which can potentially occur in an enterprise or academic uh, institutions. In this case what we are referring to is the presence of multiple APs with identical SSIDs around the, around the enterprise or an academic institution. So one important thing to note is that most of the organizations have some policies against their authorized Wi-Fi clients communicating to external APs or it may be a uh, metro or municipal AP for that uh, matter. The reason is obvious, nobody will want their uh, users to communicate with their neighboring APs. So what we are saying here is that in the presence of multipod, uh, such policies may not be implemented by the present day VIPs. So as a result, uh, there can be non-policy compliant uh, communication in uh, uh, such enterprises in presence of multipod. The second threat scenario which we have uh, already uh, referred to is what is known as the handcrafted or a malicious variant of multipod in which case the attacker can uh, deliberately set up uh, a multipod uh, close to a hotspot uh, uh, AP and uh, lure the clients into connecting to such a multipod. And consequently, the uh, attacker may be able to launch man-in-the-middle attacks on the client and retrieve uh, any sensitive information such as passwords or credit cards uh, from, that, from such an AP. And again, as we have discussed earlier, uh, the present day uh, intrusion prevention systems will not be able to uh, basically stop this attack. So let us look at the related work of uh, some of the researchers in this uh, area. So in the past there have been some conjectures that uh, the wireless uh, intrusion prevention of uh, uh, say WIPs can be uh, evaded in future. Like one specific work uh, in this direction is from uh, Josh Wright who basically created a paper uh, stating that wireless intrusion prevention techniques uh, in a uh, VIPs are good but they, they can have two problems. One is that they can be fingerprinted and the second is that uh, there, can, they can be, uh, there can be some evasive techniques against that. However, he has not mentioned any specific evasion, evasive techniques and we believe that this is a, a first evasive technique which we are uh, presenting currently. And similarly, uh, there is uh, some work uh, from DARPA and Department of Homeland Security and the project is called MAP, which is an acronym for Measure, Analyze and Protect. And this is also aimed at uh, creating defenses against future attacks. And uh, even in this case, they are not meant refer to any specific uh, new attacks against WIPs. And we, we believe that uh, this is one of, one of the new attacks. So having understood some of the details of multipod, uh, what we want to do is we want to show a live demonstration of the multipod I have my colleague Sohel here and I would like to acknowledge his help and uh, one more colleague Amit's help in this demo and what we are going to show is that the multipod uh, a author, a client can communicate uh, even in presence of a VIP sensor uh, while it is uh, connecting to a multipod. So let me give you a brief uh, 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 explanation on the setup of the demo. So as you can see on the picture we have a authorized Wi-Fi client. We are using Centrino for uh, for this purpose, and we have two uh, APs uh, constituting a multipod. So one of the APs is on channel three, and another AP is on channel ten, and uh, they have some SSID. And the client will be communicating with this uh, multipod APs. And what we will notice is that the deauthentication attack launched by a laptop which is acting as a sensor in this case will not be able to stop, stop such communication. Yes, so what will be seen in the demo is that the Centrino client will swift, swiftly hop between APs in the multipod 
in response to the deauthentication session containment. And as a result, the ping traffic, which we are using as an illustration, will continue to happen uh, even in presence of the session containment. Sorry? It's, bo it's both ways, basically. That is what is leading the client to hop. Right. So what we are saying is, if you have one AP, this is going to work. If you have one AP, this is going to work. But if you have multiple APs, it will go and jump and hop onto the other channel. And the communication continues there. Right. So, right. See, the problem is, as I mentioned earlier, Say, if the VIP sensor sends deauthentication or dissociate frames on one of the channels, it will hop on to the other channel, right? So now, if I understand you right, you are suggesting that you send it on all the channels. Right. So what I, if you notice, one of the things I also mentioned is that when you send dissociate frames even after it has hopped, there is a limit on the number of channels on which you can do it concurrently. As I explained earlier, a sensor will typically not be able to uh, uh, contain a client on more than two channels. So suppose, I mean, the approach you are saying will work with two channels. But if you have a third channel, the sensor will not be able to contain that. That is why what we are saying is the deauthentication based approach has a fundamental limitation in handling uh, such multipots. No, the time difference is... Right. No, but what I am saying is basically uh, there is a limit to which you can do it that way because of the fact that the authentication packets will let the client hop. That is where the problem is. So you cannot solve it in a generic way. It can be a patch solution to that, but our argument is that there is a fundamental problem in the fact that the authentication leads a client to hop and that is not a good uh, thing. So now let us uh, look at the demo. So what we can see in the demo is that we are having a Sentinel client which is pinging uh, one of the APs, uh, uh, which is pinging a uh, uh, laptop which is connected uh, at the back end of both the APs in the multipot. So what we are seeing is that the ping communication is actually continuing even in presence of a deauthentication attack. And what we can see in the background is a software called Wi-Fi Hopper, which basically uh, gives us, uh, which represents what uh, AP is a client connected to. So if you can notice, the yellow bar is the AP, uh, the yellow bar is the AP to which the client is connect currently connected. And as we can clearly see, that is blinking, which means that the client is actually getting disconnected temporarily uh, and then it is again reconnecting to the next AP in the multipot. And what we can also see is that the ping communication is happening with, uh, with very minimal disruption. So this uh, ping we have used as just a representative traffic. Uh, however, the important point to note is that uh, in presence of multipot, the communication, any communication continues and this is definitely a serious threat. Uh, for today's Wi-Fi enterprises. <coughs> so.
So, to conclude the talk, what we have showed is that the multipod threat will basically uh, create more complications to the already prevalent evil twin threat and the present day countermeasures are completely ineffect ineffective against that. Especially the deauthentication based uh, session containment used in uh, most of the VIPs today, uh, they are not uh, sufficient to prevent this threat and hence uh, there needs to be some uh, effort and investigation in this direction to prevent this uh, threat from creating more uh, uh, security issues. So, and this uh, concludes my talk and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer it now or I can, uh, uh, I'll be available in the Q&A room and I'll be available till uh, tomorrow. So, thanks a lot for your time and uh, if you have any questions, I can take that up. Yeah, the SSID is Vegas. The SSID is Vegas and there are two APs with, uh, there are two Cisco APs and uh, they have different BSSIDs. So I'm sorry, we could not enlarge it further. Yes, the, the, the fact that the yellow bar is blinking shows that the client is hopping between two APs and the ping communication still continues. Right, thanks a lot.